We are ready to go. So my um, talk is going to last a little bit over, like maybe through to the end of lunch, because um, what I have to say is so important. Um, actually, it is. It is all about selectors. We're going to go from the basic element selector all the way to stuff that you haven't heard of yet. So if you're new to selectors, learn for the first five minutes, and then sit back and enjoy what, is, what you will be capable of doing, and then you'll know what to look up. And if you are super advanced at selectors, pay attention the entire time because there's going to be little quirks that you probably didn't know. So a little bit about me. My name is Estelle Weil. I actually uh, co-authored this book, CSS, The Definitive Guide. So I know how to write, like, I read the specifications so you don't have to. Um, and that is basically what this talk is. So I'm sorry if um, I'm going to try to make it super exciting and interesting. Uh, but the specifications can be dry. Um, and I wrote some other books because I don't know what to do with my free time. Um, and I work at a company called Adapar, and we are hiring, so that's the plug. And then this site isn't coming through because of, uh, of uh, hotel Wi-Fi, but I'm or organizing a conference called Perf Matters. It's all about web performance. It's in Redwood City. It is March 27th and 28th, so check that out. And now we can get started with our talk. So what we're going to talk to, about today is not really the property and value pair, but a selector, which is how you choose an element on the page, or many elements on the page. So we're going to be talking about what here says selector A or selector B. Um, we're going to be talking a little bit about pseudo classes and pseudo elements and attribute selectors. So it's going to go from the really basic to some people might not understand what's up on the screen. That's fine if you don't yet. You will by the end of today. I'm going to go through this really fast because there's uh, only 80 slides, but it, um, this can take upwards of three hours if I actually slow down and answer questions. So we're going to try to keep it under an hour. So basic selectors are IDs, um, element selectors, and class selectors. So for an ID selector, you put a pound sign in front of it, and it should be unique on the page. But if it's not unique, if you have many elements with the same ID, you shouldn't, but it will style all of them. Um, if you uh, have a class, you just put a period in front of the name of that class. It is case sensitive. It will match all the elements um, with that class. And then you can use element selectors. And here I chose an LI. But if you would invent an element like foobar or selector A, and that is the name of your element, um, it is not limited to uh, the elements uh, in HTML. You can actually create any element you want, and CSS will automatically, your browser will automatically render it. If you're doing IE8 or earlier, you have to create that element. Anyone doing IE8 or earlier, you need to look for a new job. <laughs> Um, and the thing is, I've made that joke three years in a row, and I really didn't think I would have to say that this year. OK, so um, this is what you call uh, DNS not working from the hotel Wi-Fi. But if you actually want, if I was doing a workshop, this would be a time to play with it. But I assume everyone here knows those three selectors, so I'm going to move on. In CSS selectors level one, we were given uh, these selectors. We have the element selector the descendant selector, which is just a space. And that is actually a combinator. That space is called a combinator. So you think it's just a space, but it actually has a name. Combinators in CSS have no value in terms of specificity. I'll talk about specificity in a little bit. Um, CSS level one gave us class selectors, ID selectors, as well as a, two pseudo classes of link and active. We didn't get focus or any of the other ones in CSS one. Um, in CSS2, we were given some more. We were given the global, and then we were given the child combinator. So that arrow is actually a child combinator, has no weight in terms of specificity, but increases how specific you can be with the selector. The plus sign is the adjacent, um, and I'm going to cover all of these. But that's what we got in level two, and I'm going to cover all of these in detail. So you think, okay, I already know this stuff, right? Then we have what we have um, with CSS3, which is some um, pseudo elements, um, some attribute selectors, uh, the tilde, the root, and then nth of child and nth of types, as well as last of, um, empty, target, and then the not, with, which is the negation selector. So we're going to cover all of those. 
And then we have more. So in CSS, um, in the UI um, level three, which only came into selectors level four, but it was actually around before, um, it was actually around at the same time as CSS level three, were the UI selectors. And we're gonna cover all of these, except for read, write, and read only. Um, and then CSS selectors four, we're actually going to cover some of these. So this is what we're going to cover today, because if you actually take a look, oh, maybe we'll got some more, why not? Um, let's open this in a new window, if it allows me to. Open link in a new tab. And it asks me to connect to Wi-Fi. And, oh, I know where I can get this, here. Sorry for doing this. Okay, there it is. Um, if you take this and you just go down, here's a list of all the selectors and it can open up in a new window. So if you want to print this up, put it at your desk at work. Um, because everyone has paper on their desk. Just joking. Um, what happened? Oh. Sorry. I don't want to connect to Wi-Fi. I do want to be on this page here. So I realize it's too small. I didn't really want you to read it. So let me introduce you briefly to specificity. Um, I created this sheet called Specificity. And it is actually at specificity.com, so you can just uh, go there and, and download it. Um, but what it explains is uh, this, how, how the weight of a selector um, increases specificity. So we have the global selector, which is the asterisk. We have plankton, which are element selectors and pseudo-elements. We have fish, which are pseudo-classes and attribute selectors and nth of types or anything with the colon in front of it or anything in the brackets. And then we have ID selectors, which I have chosen on purpose to use a shark, because sharks are mean, and you don't like them, and you certainly don't want to run into two of them, but you don't even want to run into one of them. So avoid them, and I'll talk a little bit about that. Um, but they're definitely better than the oil tanker, um, which is the BP oil tanker, uh, which is the inline style, which not that I'm opinionated or anything, but that is my vision of the, um, of, uh, the important. Um, so... I will go into depth in this in a bit, but what I want to bring up, like towards the end, after I've gone over all the selectors, I'll go over this again in more depth. But what I'm going to be saying a lot is 100 and 010 and 001, and I really, I'm just gonna turn off my Wi-Fi so it can leave me alone. Okay, maybe now it'll stop asking. Um, so when you say the specificity of an element or of a selector, you read it from, um, basically the left-hand side has the most weight, so a 100 will be stronger than a, a 0.270. Whatever number on the left-hand side is greatest takes precedence. If they're all equal, then the one in the middle takes precedence. And if they're all equal, then the one on the right, whichever one is highest. All being equal, it's whichever one comes later in the cascade. So if you declare color green on, an element and then color blue on an element, same element, is it gonna be green or blue? It depends which one has the higher specificity in terms of the selector. If they have the same specificity, then it's which one comes later in the CSS. The asterisk, or the global selector, has a specificity of zero. So it means it does have a specificity, it's just the value of zero. So it does actually match an element, it just doesn't add any weight. Um, and then combinators, as I said before, tilde, greater than, and plus have no value, and we're gonna cover those um, combinators in a little bit. Okay, so now let's really get started with the selectors. This is probably what 99% of people use, up above the one that says new to IE7. Um, ULLI, there's a space between there, and it means any LI that is descendant of a, of, um, a UL. If I touch the OLLI, the A, B, and C are actually hit twice, once because they're a descendant of the LI and, or OL, and once because they are a descendant of the UL. This is any descendant. It could be child, grandchild, great-grandchild, great-great-great-great-great-grandchild. If you put a greater than symbol in there, which is the child selector, it says only match the LI, which is a direct descendant of that OL, and that is why A, B, and C are no longer highlighted. Then you have the plus sign. 
And that is the adjacent sibling selector. So it means find whatever this is and only select one element if it is an LI that comes immediately after it. Um, in a UL, there's not going to be anything else other than an LI because there is no element that is a, child, a, a descendant of an unordered or ordered list other than an LI. But if you had like a, a paragraph and said, select this paragraph that comes after an H1, if you had an H2 and that was a plus sign, right, it would not reach that paragraph because there's something in between. In IE7, we got the tilde, which is the general sibling selector which means find the LI that has a class, so number four has a class, and match all of the siblings that are LIs that come afterwards. So we have adjacent sibling, which is the one immediately after it, and general sibling, which is all the ones after it. Have people learned something already? Okay, good. So we are only on slide 18, this goes up to 80. Um, and then new is the descendant combinator, I totally forgot what this does because um, it's not usable yet, and it wasn't when I wrote this uh, in December. Uh, so I would have to look it up, but we're going to have a, um, a descendant combinator. Um, and I th oh, I remember what it does. The space combinator, remember when I told you that the space was actually a combinator? This says, basically, this is a different way of writing the space. It says, this is actually, like, uh, so the greater than, the double greater than is... Um, to make it obvious that it is a descendant selector instead of just the not visible space. Okay, so I do remember things. Another good use of everything that we've learned already and everything that we're going to learn for the rest of today is the selectors API. Native in JavaScript is query selector and query selector all. And you can use all of the selectors that we're covering today. So it's not just in CSS to select an element, but it's in JavaScript to select an element. Okay, next we have attribute selectors. I'm going to start off with the ones that have been around the longest. One is, does the um, attribute exist? And that's all it does. So it's element, bracket, attribute. So the first one says, any image that also has an alt attribute. So it's the image element with an alt attribute. And this is a really good way of figuring out, um, you just quickly put in your code, um, image uh, alt display none and any image that is still visible you forgot to put the alt attribute and it's not accessible and here I have the descendant combinator that you can't see but I'll be able to write that soon and that says any element that has a type attribute that is a descendant of a form element so it would match like an input of type date but not a select uh, I cannot remember at this point if um, it matches the type attribute even if it's not present with input. I think it does because the browser automatically puts it in there because it's uh, defaults to type text if you don't put a type in there. So that was a basic one. Let's go into a little bit more complex ones, the ones that were given to us in CSS2. We had attribute, whether it was present, or attribute equals an, an exact value case sensitive if the attribute is case sensitive. So in HTML, the attributes that you get by default are not case sensitive. So input type date, type equals date, whether it's all capital or all lowercase, would match, right? If I did, let me see, I'm not sure if this is editable, no. Um, so let's just go back here, and if I did type equals date, it would match, or if it was type equals date, it would also match, because that attribute value is not sen uh, case sensitive. However, if I done class equals date, that is different than class equals date. Two different things. So that would not match. Um, so that is the equal sign. Then we have the uh, pipe with the equals, and what that means is Anything that starts with the, vowel of, the value of vowel, either that's it or followed by a dash. So if you are doing languages like um, lang equals en dash us or lang equals en or lang equals en dash uk, lang 
pipe equals en would match all three of those. Sign, first of all, you should be declaring your language all the time. Always declare the language. But what other use does this have? A lot of people are using, um, you know, different, like, button, and uh, class button, and then button dash active, button dash active, dash arrow down, dash yellow, dash. Don't put all those, but if you're going to, you could actually hit all your buttons that way. Or all the class button dash that way. Then we have the tilde equals value. And that means that the value val is a space separated word somewhere in your value. So it could be the first one, and by space it could be the quotes on the end. Um, or any space uh, separated word in the middle. Notice some of these have quotes and some of these don't have quotes. You don't need the quotes if it's just one word, but if you have any special characters in there, you need a quote, so just put quotes in. Um, make it easier to understand. Now we get to the fun ones, which are a little bit more regular expression-like. We have caret equals, which means starts with. We have dollar sign equals, which means ends with. And we have star equals, which means any sub string anywhere within the value. So these can be super useful. Uh, the examples I give are putting background uh, images based on the content of a URL. So if you have something that ends in PDF, you know, dollar sign equals PDF, it probably should be period with the quotes, because period would make it require that it has the quotes too. Uh, but then it's not case insensitive. And We'll cover that in a second, because there is a solution to that. Um, but in the first example, uh, caret equals mail to, put a background image of an email icon. So if it starts with mail to, you know it's an email link, put a little email icon next to it so they know it's an email link. Um, starts with HTTP S colon, that would be better. Um, when you're doing a print style sheet, actually write out what the URL is, because so, you can't actually touch and go to a link on a piece of paper. So this is, that is a great solution for print style sheet. Similarly, dollar sign equals PDF um, or dot doc. Anytime you have an external, um, anytime you're going to load a file that's going to open up a plugin or a download, let them know ahead of time with some type of indication. So here I put a background image of a PDF icon or content PDF uh, right afterwards. Notice on the bottom it says multiple attributes work. So you can actually join together a bunch of attribute selectors. Bracket this, bracket that. It has to match all of them. So when I was talking about case sensitivity, in um, CSS selectors level four, we actually have um, the I, which stands for case insensitive. So dot .pdf, whether it was capital or lowercase, would work. Um, and that I just noticed working in my inspector a few weeks ago, so it's, it's getting support. Um, and there's a can I use page, but I can't go there right now because I went offline, so it stopped getting little pop-ups. Okay, so a little recap of all of our attribute selectors. Uh, I have a little cheat sheet right here. You just press the number two if you're following along, and it tells you everything about these. Um, these. So uh, because we are pressed for time, I'm not going to go into, yeah. Oh, we covered all of them. Let me just go over the part on the bottom, um, which is media print. It's really nice to have print style sheets that take advantage of attribute selectors because there's a lot of attributes that you're putting for the interactivity when you're clicking that a user might want to see if they're actually, um, if they printed your document. So um, in these two cases, I have uh, abbreviation, if it has a title, attribute, when you're on the, key, uh, on the computer, you can hover over it or touch it, and the title will um, appear, and it will actually, if it has a title attribute, it will say what BEM stands for, um, or USA, United States of America, in case you didn't know. Um, so if you're printing it the first time, it would be great to have one, or even every time. Um, similarly, if you're printing, if you have a link, it's underlined, the user... Um, reading on a piece of paper, doesn't know what that link was, write out the, um, the 
uh, the, the href attribute, the value of the href attribute. So to go over what that is doing right there, that is generated content. So we're going to cover generated content a teeny bit afterwards. But what that says is find the title attribute or the href attribute, print that in between two, uh, parentheses. So when you have generated content, the browser does not parse it. So like if you have a URL string, if it's just a URL, it will do that. But if it's just like in a string, it will not actually parse it. Um, it just reads it as HTML. OK, if you wanted to play along, uh, here is the example. Oops. There. OK, so here, just to show, uh, let me just go one smaller. I have no clue why it's cutting off, but we will deal with that. Um, so here, I'm going to do h uh, ref ends in. What's the ends in? Anyone remember? Dollar sign equals PDF, lowercase. So we have two of them, right? Uh, there's one down there, and there's one up there. And then. I am going to make it PDF, capital. And now it is oh, the overline is gone. It's underlined, because that's a default. If I put a space in, oop, and I put an I, did you see that change? That means case insensitive. So there it is actually working. Let me go back to bigger. OK. So then we have pseudo classes. And that is based on the current state of the user interface. So these were put into CSS selectors level four, but they were actually in, UI, in the UI um, like in 2002 or some really ridiculously early period. So it made into CSS before it made into the CSS spec. OK, so we have enabled elements. We have disabled elements. We have checked. And we have not checked, which we can do not colon checked. And we'll cover that later. And then we have indeterminate, which is in CSS level four, which is when you have a checkbox, and so you can really just get to indeterminate space uh, with uh, JavaScript. So you can set the value of a checkbox to indeterminate. Um, and then it will match this, which is, let, let's say you say select all your um, emails. You have the checkbox, and then you uncheck three of them. And the one on top, that little box where you did check all, it's not checked, it's not unchecked, it's indeterminate. There's just a line through it. And that's the default state for indeterminate. But you can style that. So. Enable, disable, check, they're kind of self-evident, the other ones. So let's read this selector that we have right here. Selectors are read, actually, from right to left. So it's the label that comes immediately after a checked checkbox. So right now, this is not checked. If I check it, will it turn to red? Yes. If I uncheck it, it's no longer red. Two things to note about this, or one other thing to note about this, is the fact that I used a label. Labels make your site accessible. Not just because a screen reader will associate that checkbox with um, if I put the for attribute in, but also because this box is tiny. I can check right here on the label, and it toggles that checkbox off and on. So please always use labels. So we have more. UI pseudo classes. We have default, valid, invalid, required, optional, in range, out of range, read only, read write, placeholder shown, and user invalid. So I know user invalid is not yet supported because they just changed it from user error to user invalid like last week. So I don't think browsers have caught up. Maybe it is. Maybe uh, user error and user invalid both work. I don't know. I haven't tested those. But let's talk a little bit about um, the ones that are relevant to us and make our lives really easy. So in this form here, I have no JavaScript. I'm styling those with CSS. And the HTML I put in is input, type equals number, minimum is 5, maximum is 7, put the required attribute, and put aria required equals true, which now I don't really need to do as much, but just to, you know, in case someone's browser doesn't understand required. Put that in there. And then I've input type number min equals 0, max equals 10, with a step of 0.1. So you're learning a little bit of HTML along with selectors, and you learned a little bit of JavaScript. Isn't this awesome? OK, so what I said is if, it, if the input is valid, the border should be green. 
If the input is invalid, the border should be red. If it is required, the border should be five pixels wide. All right? If it is optional, the border should be 10 pixels wide. And if it is in range, it should be light green. If it's out of range, it should be pink. Anything that is empty is in range because it's not out of range. But this is, right now, it's invalid. Um, it has a red border because it is required. And therefore, it is not optional. It's not valid because it, there is no value. The second I put a value in, it is still invalid, but it is also out of range because that value is not between five and seven. So if I click the upper thing, it'll go to five and it turns green. No JavaScript, right? This is just CSS showing the user that their input is valid or invalid. Now this is great because you don't have to make this hideous design. Instead, you can put a little icon that when it has focus and it's invalid, put a little warning signal. When it's valid, put a little check mark. Background image will not be accessible to the screen reader, but this is enhancing user interface. It's not detracting from anyone. So just putting a background image provides information to sighted users. If I do put 5.9, right, that's 5.9, it's between 5 and 7, but it is not matching the step of 1. A little bit more of the HTML that you guys do not know, or you people do not know, perhaps, is that the step attribute by default is 1.0, so it'll increment by one. And this is not, even though I didn't declare the step attribute, because I have a min and max, it's not valid, uh, because it's, uh, it doesn't match. So here, I could put 5.9, and it's valid, because I put a step of 0.1, and then if I change that step, it's out of range, because it is not an acceptable value. And that is wrong, it is invalid, but it is still not pink. Oh, out of range, sorry, four. Nope, it goes down to 10, so negative, let's put a negative. There we go, sorry. I have to read my own HTML. So it's out of the range of the min max, and out of, um, it's also invalid due to the step. Okay. So, if you were to play along, you could. This would be uh, where you can change all the attributes. It's a little play sheet. I'm just gonna do an email address, which is uh, A. That's not a valid email address. At B. That is a valid email address because it could be on an intranet. And then if I do C at D, it is not valid, but if I put a little comma in there, it is valid because those are multiple email addresses. So comma separated, a little HTML, to, oh, this is a fun one. Okay, so remember when I was talking about generated count, content? We also have counters in um, CSS. So what I'm going to do is, right now it says I have zero invalid entries. And I'm going to count. So on the body, I'm going to reset my invalid counter, uh, my counter of invalid count. And every time I hit an invalid element, no matter what that element type is, the background color is gonna turn pink and I'm going to increment my counter. And then in the paragraph that comes after all of those invalid values, I'm gonna write, you have, with a space, counter invalid count. It's gonna print that count, invalid entries. Because it's CSS, generated content, not JavaScript, I can't, when it hits one, I'm not, it's just gonna say invalid entries, not invalid entry, which is incorrect grammar. Um, but I'm probably the only person who cares about incorrect grammar, so you know, do what you will with that information. So when I hit four, it turns pink, and now I have one invalid entry, and two, and three, and A. I have four invalid entries. No JavaScript, right? So CSS can help provide user information. This is not the best thing to do, because uh, one, you should never put important information in your CSS because it is presentation, you should put it in your HTML. Um, but without JavaScript, you can still provide a lot of information um, to your user. So I have another talk, which was a talk I was thinking of giving here, which is forms, where I go into this deep dive. Um, let's keep, move on. So we have structural selectors. We have root, empty, blank, nth child, 
and the last child, which starts counting from the bottom. First child, which was actually around in CSS2, that's the only one of these that was. Uh, last child, only child, nth of type, nth last of type, which counts from the bottom, first of type, last of type, and only of type. Um, basically, all of these uh, define elements based on their relationship to other elements within the DOM. And if you update the DOM, like if you add a row to a table, it updates automatically. You don't have to change classes. So let, I'm going to, like a lot of those are a little bit confusing, so I'm going to actually go over these six by example. And I'm going to open up this in a new page. It works, okay. So what I have here is, hold on. That did not work. Okay. Um, I want to increase the font size of the little thing on the top. Okay, there you can read it. Good enough. So, okay. I'm going to get rid of the text underline because I find that really annoying. Um, is there anyone? I'm going to uh, just change this to X. Is there anyone that cannot see that color change? That's enough of a color contrast that you can see that color change? Okay. Um, the underline was for uh, uh, people with color blindness, but I, don't, I think this is enough contrast for everyone to be able to handle. So this says star, make it blue, right? So that's global selector. Now if I do first, oops, first of type, Everything's blue. Does anyone know why everything is blue? Because body is the first of its type, right? Now if I did first child, I have no clue why it's all blue anymore. Last child? It's still all blue. Who knows what my code looks like? Okay, so let me just do body and then do last child. So anything that's in the body, and I'll just leave body there so that um, I don't make too many more mistakes on stage. Okay, so this says last child. So there's divs, and within those divs, there's H1s, paragraphs, H2s. So in this one, the paragraph is the last child, the paragraph is the last child, the paragraph is the last child, um, and the H1 is the last child because it's also the first child. But that div is also the last child of the body. So it would have been blue anyway. So if I do H1, that is the last child, only the last one is the last child because the other ones are. Um, but if I do last of type, they're all blue. So that's the difference between type and child. Child is actually, is this the last child? Does it also match the H1, right? So it's the child, not of its type. If I do anything last of type, I would get the H1, the last paragraph, the last H2, there's two H2s, right? So any element that is the last of its type versus last child. So you see child matches something that is a child and last of type matches every element that is the last of its type. So if I, if, if I do um, last of type, and I do first of type instead, uh, this one, the whole div is blue because it's the first div. It's the first div of its type. This is the first paragraph and the first H1 and the first H2. It's the first of its type. How about if I do only of type? This one has three paragraphs, so none of the paragraphs get blue, but it only has one H1, so the H1. This one has two H2s, so the two H2s don't get, but the one that is only of its type um, gets hit. Um, we did first child, last child, only of type, only child. And that would only match the last one, which is the one that is the only, of it, only child. 
Does that make sense, the difference between of type versus child? Okay. Okay, so that was the simpler way of doing it, which is just basically it's the, one, the first or the last. But you can pick anything else in between. We have an equation, and the equation is a n plus b, where the letter n is always n. It's the incrementer, I think that's the word. I can't remember, algebra one was 38 years ago or something like that. Yeah, so it's been a long time since I took algebra one, but I think it was the incrementer. Um, no, maybe not. Uh, and the offset, who, who knows? I don't want to remember algebra one. So you have two key terms, odd and even. So odd is 2n plus 1. Even is just 2n. But anytime you have the letter n, it is, comes immediately after, like the, the, you can't have a space there. So this is valid, but this is not valid. So the equation is a n plus b, which the b is the offset. And so you can start counting at number 16 if you wanted to. Why not? Any number you want. Or you can start counting at number minus 1. So if I did 3n minus 1, that would match the second element, the fifth element, the eighth element, which would be this, doing the same thing as 3n plus 2, which would match the second element, the fifth element, and the eighth element. You can match just one single element, nth of type 5. That means 0n doesn't match, doesn't increment at all. It just matches the fifth one. Or you can just do 3n simply, and it matches every third one, which would be the third, the sixth, the ninth. So in this example here, we have first child and last child, which are bold. So number 1 and number 10 are bold. We have first of type, last of type, which have a line through it, which is the exact same thing in this case as first child and last child, because we have an unordered list and there's no other children. Then we have li nth child even. So uh, number two, four, six, eight, and 10 have a background of gray, and that's how I striped it. Pretty easy to stripe something nowadays. Um, nth child three, so only the third one is going to have a color of gray, and so item number three is uh, not black or blue like the other elements. Odd stripe is white nth of type 4n, which is every fourth, so number 4, 8, 12, 16, if those were there, um, are blue. And nth of type 3n minus 1 is going to be aligned right. So we start with 3n, which is 3 minus 1, 2. We make n 2, which is 6 minus 1, 5. And then 8, and then 11. And as you see, number 2, 5, and 8 are aligned to the right. Before we had flexbox, this is how I used to do flexbox. When it was the only of its type, make it 100% wide. If it was the last of its type, um, and also the second from the start, that meant there were exactly two, and I could make it 50% wide. If there were exactly three, by saying if it's the nth of type one, and nth last of type, starting from the bottom, going up, the third one from the bottom, that meant there were exactly three, and I could do it with 33%, and so on. And now we have Flexbox, and we don't need this gibberish anymore. So let's just watch me play, because why not? Um, so I'm just going to do 2n, right? Oop. 2n, it's the same thing. And 2n, it's the same thing. And 2n plus 1 is the same thing as odd. And 2n plus 1 is the exact same thing. But what if I do 4n and 4n? and 4n, and 4n. And then I put a comma here, and we're less than halfway done, and they're already done. Okay, and if I do plus 3, or no, plus 2, and then plus 3, we can do stripes. Why not? Or you can just do the American flag. That's the previous table turned into the American flag. And what did I use? I basically said, um, make the whole thing white, and the background white, and the text white. So everything's white. 
because that way I don't have a table anymore. Um, and then I said every TD, so adjacent selector, every TD that comes after the eighth cell of its type in an odd row, and every TD at all that comes in an odd row starting with the ninth one right here, start on the ninth row and every TD after that in, in, in those rows, um, every odd row starting with nine, so nine, 11, and 13, make it red. And so that made the red stripes. Uh, the red stripes, because everything was white, we added some red stripes. And then I said, in those cells, but start from the end, go in nine cells um, and up seven rows, and all of those, um, make them blue. And then I went to every odd one of those and added the stars, and then um, all the odd ones of those and moved it over. So this is not what you're supposed to be doing on your Friday nights, but you can. Just don't put this into production. It's mostly to show you how it can be done and for you to have something to play with afterwards. OK, so root. Root in HTML is the HTML element. It's basically the root element. Why do we need root? Because not everything is an HTML document. You might have an XML document. Um, roots are also useful because that's when you're declaring um, uh, root M units, rems. You want to declare it, your font size, on the root. You could also declare it on the HTML. It will work too. But um, use root. Uh, and how did I do those exercises? So you saw that I was editing the CSS styles. I basically, I displayed the head. Um, uh, I displayed the head as block and then hit everything in the head except for the style. So I actually just, the fact that I styled the root meant that my head element had some styling to it. Um, and in CSS level four, when you're uh, doing um, using variables. With CSS, you want to declare your variables um, on the root element as well, unless you're overwriting them, and then be more specific. OK, so blank and empty. Empty is any empty element. So when we are learning HTML, we learn that an image and an input and an HR and a BR, anything that you could put a backslash at the end of an, uh, that's an empty element. That will match empty, colon empty. That matches all your images all your BRs, all your inputs. It also matches any element that has nothing inside, such as this one right here, or if it's just a comment. The thing is, people were accidentally putting in this, or, um, um, or a space, and then you couldn't match it. Um, and if you use content management systems, you often just get a bunch of gibberish or the table cell that has a space in it because your WYSIWYG put a space in it. Um, that will be matched by blank, which wasn't supported when I tested in December, um, but it was supported in another way like Moz white space only. And the reason I keep saying December is uh, I only found out I was talking at this conference on Friday. So I didn't have time. I updated it, but didn't have time to test everything. OK. Then we have not. I love not. Um, it excludes stuff. So it's just colon not. And then you can put any simple selector in here. And it will exclude it if it matches that. Now, by simple selector, um, That's a simple selector. You just learned it today. It might seem a little complex, or n flask of type 7n. Those are simple selectors. A complex selector is one that has a combinator in it, like a space, or greater than sign, or anything like that. So it basically takes a simple selector. Now, in terms of specificity, what happens, right? So a div not li would be stupid, right? But um, a class of... Uh, my list, right? My list, but not an LI. I don't know why I just chose that. 
That would match anything that has the class of my list as long as it's not an li element. Um, so what is the specificity of this? You get 0, 0, 1 for the li because that's an element selector and you get 0, 1, 0 for the class selector. And before when it was div, div not li makes no sense, but this would be a specificity of 0, 0, 2. Um, This would be 0, 2, 0. The not has no weight. It's a combinator, basically. So it's whatever is inside that, ha that, gives, uh, that adds to the specificity. It's the argument. Um, so far supported in Safari, at least in December, was uh, that you could put more than one in there. You could put more than one. Um, um, uh, simple selector, and would say any div that does not have the class of exclude me or excuse you. And this is really powerful because it prevents you from doing really weird, jankish stuff um, to make sure to exclude something. Um, and then in terms of specificity, I cannot recall if it's the, uh, I think it is the value here that has the highest weight, so if it was this, and that, it would be a one, zero, one, one, zero, zero for the ID and zero, zero, one for the div. Double check that, don't take my word on it because I need to recheck that one because I forgot. Okay, so let's just do an example here. I basically said make everything red. No, originally, I'll just get rid of this. Okay. Make everything um, red, except for something that is the first child. And this inherits the red from this. And I don't have a style on it, and that's why I put this in. So this turned blue because this matched all of that, everything, except for this element and this element. But when I didn't have this, right, I wasn't actually defining what that color was, so it was an inheriting. Does that make sense? Okay. In Safari right now, but in the future, we're going to have matches. So instead of, um, like, let's say you have this long selector, which you should never have a long selector, but let's say you do, um, or more for in JavaScript when you need to use these long selectors, you can use matches. So you can have, like, um, if the body matches home page or contact, and then the rest of your selector. So you don't have to do a separate, like, commas. It's basically doing SAS for us. Okay, that's not me. That's good. I'm like, I put it on buzzer. Um, and then we have any. Um, so this is official. This is spec. This is what's supported. So in WebKit, so remember that this is supported in Safari, the matches. We have any in Opera, Chrome, and Mozilla. And who knows what we have in Windows? Who cares? Um, so WebKit any and Moz any is the same as matches. And you can also do nav a not matches these things. So you can really get complex and shoot yourself in the foot. Uh, remove from the specification was a reference combinator, which was like when you have a label for an input, you could actually target the label so it wouldn't have to be next to each other. But that was removed because um, performance issues. Um, and then we had a parent selector, which was originally written bang greater than and is now written as has. And I'm not online, but I don't know. Um, what the, so I can't tell you what the support is because uh, I haven't looked at it in a while. Uh, but you could say header that has an H1 through an H6 and would match only headers that actually contained headers. Um, and you could say headers that does not have an H1 through H6. So this is like a header that doesn't actually have any headers. Um, 
And this one is the kind of like the inverse or the meta or whatever, which is find a header that has no headers, uh, headings, but has some other element. So it has something, but it's not an H1 through H6. I was just trying to confuse people and I confused myself in the process. I did a good job. Yay. Okay. Well, then we have language pseudo classes. So we already covered the, the, uh, the pipe equals, right, for the attribute selector. And we also in CSS 2.1 uh, had lang, so you could put lang en or en dash us. Um, in CSS, so the thing with the first two is it, uh, the first one matches just the element that you're selecting. So it doesn't say, oh, is this paragraph down there English? It just says, oh, this HTML is declared as English. Um, with lang, you can actually say, is the language of this, was this declared earlier to be English? And we'll match. Um, and then selectors level four uh, put it on crack, which is like, there's a few languages that they have in China, like Mandarin and Cantonese, so it would be any language that you would have. Oh wait, that CH, isn't that Switzerland? Oh, I'm so bad, I should know these things. Um, so basically, if it was Switzerland, it would be German, French, and Italian. If it was Chinese, and I don't know which one of the two it is, it would be Mandarin um, and Cantonese. So it would match uh, whichever country code CH is. Embarrassing. Okay. Um, and then you also have direction, which is right to left or left to right. So you can match by direction. So the cool thing about Lang is it doesn't have to be on the element itself. It's matching something that is actually in that language, whether it's on whether the language is declared on that particular element or an ancestor. Okay, so we have the link, right, that we got, it's CSS1. Is it a link? Was it visited? Um, so any link actually matches a link, whether it's visited or a link. Uh, that is new. We were going to have a local link, which means it's uh, local to the site versus an external link, which we could do not HTTP, or not attribute starts with HTTP, but sometimes you actually have a local link that does start with HTTP because you're, you know. So the last two were actually removed, and it, you could also like do a depth of like four, four um, uh, directories down, but that's been removed. Then we have user action pseudo classes. So we have hover, active, and focus. Please style all of these all of the time. Never remove a focus ring. Well, you can, you can remove a focus ring, but if you remove the focus ring, put something else on. Not everyone uses a keyboard. I mean, not everyone uses a mouse to navigate through your site. When people remove the focus rings, and I'm tabbing, and there's no indication of what is the link that is active or has focus, um, I have no clue where I am in the page. And I'm kind of, I'm average. I'm an average user. Um, but, you know, uh, I'm sure a lot of you tab through stuff too, and you want to know where you are. Because carpal tunnel is just almost so much fun. Uh, so focus ring and focus within is coming. And then we also have uh, drop areas, and I'm gonna, okay, hover, active focus. You can do something that is visited and currently hovered, or a button that is active and has focus. And never, ever, ever do star focus, outline none, because um, I added a link to, to a page in the spec that shows which links can be active, or which elements can be active. Note if you put a content editable attribute, on an element, it can be active. It can um, get the focus ring and, and um, match active. So we have drop and drop pseudo classes, which was drop, drop active, drop valid, drop invalid, drop valid active. I've never had to implement a drag and drop, so I've never actually used any of these, so I can't give you much detail on them. Target is fun. Target is basically like when you have an anchor element on the page, you can style that um, you know, like when you're going down the page and, and um, well, when you hit an anchor, like it says speakers at the top, you hit speakers, it goes down to the bottom of the page. 
You can slowly make it come in. You can make it larger. You can make, change the background color because that's what currently has focus. So it's basically the current target of the page based on uh, the ID. So it's pound sign, anchor. You have a div with an ID anchor. It becomes the target. And you can say make the first line bold or do whatever. Chris Coyer came up with this a long time ago. So it uses the pseudo class. So right now, nothing, ha nothing, there's nothing targeted on the page. We just landed on the page, so there is no target. Um, the styling is gone berserk because of my browser settings, um, including the fact that I have an overwrite on my fonts. So here it says, find any A that is a direct child of a section that is not the current target and make that direct child link, so basically that tab, gray in the background. Find the A that is the direct child of the section that is currently the target and make the background white with a bottom border that's white. Then find any div that is the direct child of that section that is not a target. Give it a z-index of negative 2. If it is the direct child of that target, give it a z-index of negative 1 so it will always be on top of the other one. So when I tab on tab 3, it becomes the target of the page. That's why it popped up because it is now as high as it needs to be, as high as it can be. That's the end of the page right there. Um, so excuse my layout. But when I do tab two or tab one, these are becoming the anchors of um, the target of the page. And I am able to do tab navigation without any JavaScript. And a horrible UI. And I just went back like 50 pages. Give me a second. Here we go. OK, so there is where we were. Scope matches any element that is a reference point for selector to match against. We don't have scoped CSS yet. This is for when we do. Um, in JavaScript, scope matches the element returned by the query selector or query selector all that I showed you earlier, um, and also matches and closest. Grid structural selectors. Um, I have not used these, and I don't think that they're uh, supported yet. Um, but we are going to be able to target things based on the grid layout, such as um, the column, nth column, nth last column. So when you have columns, you can match a column. Um, not supported yet, but look out for these in the future. We have time dimensional things, current, past, and future. We have video and audio, which is playing or paused. Now to go a little bit more into specificity. So now that we've talked about all these selectors, let's go a little bit more into specificity. So the universal selector, I said, has a specificity of zero. A single element selector has a specificity of zero, zero, one. Um, if you have two element selectors, you have zero, zero, two. If you have um, a selector list with 12, elements, I have no clue what you're doing. Don't do that. But just so you know, it would be 0012, which is less specific than a single class. A class selector is 010. If you put a, um, a global selector in front of that, it's still 010. If you're not using a class, instead you're using an attribute selector, it's like a class selector, 010. A pseudo class with a single colon, same as a class selector, 010. If you add a class selector, an attribute selector, or a relational selector, um, always, that's always 010. So if you add it with a few um, element selectors, you're talking about 012 or something like that. And we're going to fly across the page again, giving you a sneak peek of what's coming up. OK. No. Come on. OK, let's try it here. No. OK, well, I can't show you the bottom, but I wrote it out. At the bottom, this is what it says. Um, combinators, the tilde, the greater than, the double greater than, which is the same as a space, and the plus have no value, right? So these two have the same weight. This one is more specific but it has the same specificity. So if you actually did this, right, and did a color 
green and color blue, every single list item would be blue. None of them would be green because it's the same weight. It's whichever one comes last. The first one is more specific, but they have the same specificity. The not has no value, but the parameter of that selector does. And specificity is not inheritance, which is basically um, when uh, the idea is, is just because you're really, really specific, if you're not targeting that last element, that last element might not inherit from its parent. Like uh, links don't inherit the color from its parent. And it, um, color is not inherited for, um, so you can be super specific and forget to mention the A. The A is not going to change color. So always remember that you can be super specific, but other stuff might inherit from, um, in a different way. So avoid important. Um, you saw that I used the nuclear bomb option for important. Um, sometimes you want to put disabled cursor default important. Or a P button cursor equals pointer um, with an important that was supposed to be, oh. So the problem is if you have disabled, right, and the P button is disabled, but you still want your buttons to have a pointer. Um, I don't know why you would want to do that, but you do. Um, instead of using this important, do something like this. Dot disable, dot disable, dot disable. The specificity of that is 030. Zero, zero. The one below is 0-1-1. One, uh, zero dash one dash one. If you're going to do this, comment your code, right, so that people know why you did disable, disable, disable. But the way the browser does is it goes, does this element have the, the class disable? Yep, check. So it matches the third one. Let's check the second one. Does it have class disable? Yep, check. Matches the second one. So then it goes to the first one. Does it have class disabled? Yep, check. So you're, it only has to have one time disabled, but it just checks each one individually. Um, and it goes, yep, matches all three classes. Uh, I will make this, uh, this disabled paragraph button um, have a cursor of default. So that's a better way of doing it because let's say you have a third party app that uses the disabled class for something other than, you know, or an inherited disabled from a, 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 like that says anything disabled, so if the whole page is disabled because it has some widget that has, you know, whatever. You don't know what your third party is doing. Uh, or especially if you are the person developing the third party, never put an important because you're overriding the user's um, script. So let's say they used an ID. IDs are really hard to write over. Um, instead of using their widget, uh, background blue is important, which you can't overwrite, right? Um, just do their widget, pound sign, their widget, pound sign, their widget. Same thing. Does it match? Does it have the ID of their widget? Yep. Okay, so it matches the selector. Let's continue. Does it have the ID of their widget? Yep. So you can add specificity. So that one has a specificity of 2-0-0. If you're going to do this, comment out your code, but do that instead of using important. OK. Um, this one has a lot of specificity. It has a specificity of 3-0-1. Um, uh, if you basically want to say, make all links blue, you could say A, that's not some ID that doesn't exist, some other ID that doesn't exist, or the same ID that doesn't exist on your page, it will make every damn link on your page, because every link on your page will have a specificity of 3-0-1 of whatever styles you put there. So I've never used this, because I've never worked with people who wrote really bad CSS that I couldn't overwrite. Worst case scenario, you can't overwrite, they did put the important in, you can still overwrite their important. This is the hackiest of hacks. But here I have an LI, and it says color white is important. But notice all my LIs are red or orange or whatever color that is. Um, I'm just going to get rid of this. And you can see it's no longer, it's, now it's white because that was really important. So what did I do? I created an animation that just said color orange 
at the 100% mark. That's all it does. And then I call the animation on the, um, on the element, and I said animation, color, and forwards. So what that does is it iterates once over zero seconds, and then it stays at the 100% mark forever. So the animation, the color in the animation overwrites the, uh, so don't do this, you know? But if you have, if you're using someone's third party widget and you can't overwrite their code, um, last resort. Basically, it's better to do twice, like let's say they use an ID with an important, you can use twice their ID, right? Their widget, their widget, blue important, that could overwrite it. Um, but let's say you don't even know what their widget's name is, you can use this hack. Okay. How far into the second session are we? Are we hungry yet? Because I'm still going. Um, but we, are, we only have 12 slides left, so we're, we're almost good. So we have first line, first letter, selection, which is still not in the specification, but has been around forever, before and after. These all have double colons because these are pseudo elements. They are fake elements. They're elements that are created on the fly as if they had a first letter, first letter, or first line around it. Not everything about them is stylable in some cases, um, but they basically create a full element. The one before, which was pseudo classes, actually hit a DOM node, right? Based on not a class, but some other attribute. These are actually kind of creating fake elements. So we have first letter. Um, and in this case, I did the first letter that is the, f um, the first letter of a paragraph that is the first of its type. And the reason that I want to do that is because if you don't do first of its type, you get a really ugly page really fast. And I was able to style it pretty much like it could style, you know. I floated it less, which basically made it uh, display line block. Um, gave it blue, gave it some padding, made it have a line height of uh, 3M, which is uh, one, so that it would cover all three lines. Because I didn't want to, um, if I just changed it to three and didn't give it a line height, um, it would have the padding above and below which comes with line height, because that's the line height of like 1.2 or something. Or 1.4 is the default. Okay, selection. Every time I've selected anything before, right, it was blue. Here I'm saying, nope, make it red. That's selection. The reason it's not in the specification yet is because it's super hard to define exactly what a selection is. Um, so it works everywhere, pretty much. It was mod selection for many, many years, but it actually works. Uh, before and after, we've covered this a lot today, but it basically creates a faux element within the parent. So a lot of people think it comes before the DOM node, but it's actually in the DOM node before the first child, whether that child is a DOM node or a text node. So here, if I have a paragraph that says the content, the before is going to go right here, and the after is going to go right there. So in this case, I wrote content before content dash, after um, put the content space dash after content. So it actually is as if it appears like this. There is no before and there is no after element, but if you look in your um, debugger, it will actually, um, I don't know if I can edit this, yeah. It'll actually say, you've seen that, right? You've seen that? Oh, didn't mean to get rid of everything. It's important to note that it comes inside that DOM node. It's before the content and after the content of that DOM node. Uh, so, he, yes. Um, it's usually used for, I use it for styling all the time. Um, you don't want to use it for content that's important um, because you want the content that's important to be there for the um, screen reader. Uh, but I use it to like add icons to stuff on the fly, like when um, I'm printing, to add uh, the URL or the acronym. Um, when I have an acronym element and expanded out or abbreviation element and expanded out. Um, 
little, uh, when you have, you know, you put a little, make it a round bubble and you want to put a little circle underneath it to make it like a, th it's presentational, purely presentational. So the thing is, you can actually, uh, you can actually use weird characters in there. Uh, I just came up with that number in my head. I don't know what any of these things are. Uh, or you can put words. Dogs are better than cats. Tomomi. Yeah. <laughs> okay. And then remember when we used it here? You have the invalid counters. That was generated content. Um, additional pseudo elements. We have inactive selection, spelling error, grammar error, marker, placeholder, and contents. These are coming, they're not here yet. Uh, I already did that. Oh, I wanted to cover disabling selection. Only use this on mobile, and only um, if it makes sense. If you're playing a game, right? You don't want them to select something because they're tapping all the time. But sometimes you do want to prevent selecting something because it's a game and you, when you click on it, you're supposed to flip the card, not select the card and copy the text from that card or an image or something like that. So um, these three will help you disable selection. So this is not something you want to use, but just to show that it works, I'm trying to highlight this and I cannot, I cannot select that. I could select it, no, I couldn't select it, yeah, I could select it there, right? Um, but I can't select it here because I've actually attached those styles. There's um, all sorts of other pseudo elements. So these are some Microsoft ones. Uh, these are some WebKit ones. And these are them in action. So hard to see, but this uh, is a slider, right? Because I put overf um, overflow scroll on this. And let me just... Um, whenever you do a talk, don't use rem as your base m units because when you use uh, when you zoom in and you're using relative m units. Oh no, I'm using. You can use rems. Don't use uh, v width units for your font um, because uh, the viewport is not changing. Uh, so I'm increasing the font, but nothing's changing because I used viewport. So anyway, this is blue, and it has uh, a white border with an orange background or a pinkish background. This is orange right now. This is pink, and this is blue when I hover over it. And if I just go back to regular size and increase twice, I said WebKit scroll bar, give it some margins, give it a width, give it a border radius, uh, give it a box shadow, make it some weird colors, add some more colors, make it a width. So I was able to style all of these. So this is the thumb, right? That thumb, when I go over it, it turns royal blue. That's royal blue, you can't really see the color from there. But that's what I did. So you can actually style some of these elements. Don't do that, people are used to their native, um, the native look and feel of their app. Um, but I'm including it so you know it's possible and so you know what to look for. Because maybe you are actually doing a native app and you want to change everything on your app to look like uh, the forest, I don't know. Okay, so that's all I have to say about selectors. Um, I just have two more announcements. Uh, one, we're hiring. I know you're looking for a job. Come talk to me. Um, and two, uh, the Perf Matters Conference. You really want to go to it, even though I can't bring it up. We have great speakers. It's all about web performance. It's d just down in Redwood City. Um, and it's perfmattersconf.com. So does anyone have any questions? Because I have negative 45 minutes left. <laughs> How far over am I? Okay, that's not too bad. That's better than the three hours the last time I gave this talk. So, Estelle's slide deck. Um, if you want to actually use it, there's um, a tutorial on it at my GitHub. I did not plant him. So there's, um, if you go to my GitHub and look for how to do a, write a slide deck, it teaches you how to write this slide deck.
Thanks. Thank you.